We can all add further details of the decline from warrior to soldier to murderer, but it's important to notice the result. The disciplined warrior, made irrelevant by mechanized war, disdained and abandoned by the high-tech culture, is fading in American men. And the fading of the warrior contributes to the collapse of civilized society. A man who cannot defend his own space cannot defend women or children. The poisoned warriors, called drug lords, prey primarily for recruits on kingless, warriorless boys. If a culture does not deal with the warrior energy, take it in consciously, discipline it, honor it, it will turn up outside in the form of street gangs, wife-beating, brutality to children, and aimless murder. And it all moves so swiftly. The massive butcheries of 1915 finish off the disciplined or outward warrior, and then within 30 years, the warriors inside Western men begin to weaken. The double weakening makes us realize how connected the outer and the inner world are, how serious the events of history are. Warriorhood is associated with the god Mars, and Mars with iron. Men now experience a shortage of iron. Men now do not know how to retrieve and revive their inner warriors. Oftentimes that goes back to early childhood. A boy at five, for example, may put one hand on his mother's heart and the other on the earth and conduct her pain down to the ground. Or he may conduct his father's rage to the ground. Many of us lived as copper conductors of intense emotions of our parents. We lived as copper conductors, not as boys. Such a man will then look, when adult, for a woman whose pain he can continue to conduct to the earth. So we can say that men now have too much copper and not enough iron. This is another way to refer to the shortage of the interior warrior. So it was Iron John's purpose in the last warrior section to help the boy develop more iron. It's the job of the older men to do the work of initiation. We know that our society produces a plentiful supply of boys, but seems to produce fewer and fewer men. Some contemporary cultures, the New Guinea tribes would be examples, who are warrior cultures, force the boys to be men through various cunning, heated, imaginative, reckless austerities and teachings that may happen too quickly to produce a solid man. We come in at the opposite end of the spectrum in that we have no ideas at all on how to produce men, and we let it all happen unconsciously, while we look away to Wall Street and hope for the best. Michael Ventura, in a magnificent essay called The Age of Endarkenment, published recently in the Whole Earth Review, speaks of adolescent wildness and its challenge to our lack of ideas. Their music, their fashions, their words, their codes, he says, announce that the initiatory moment has come. Those extravagances are a request for a response, Ventura remarks. Tribal people everywhere greeted the onset of puberty, especially in males, with elaborate and excruciating initiations, a practice that plainly wouldn't have been necessary unless their young men were as extreme as ours. The tribal adults didn't run from this moment in their children as we do. They celebrated it. They would assault their adolescents with quite literally holy terror, rituals that had been kept secret from the young until that moment. Rituals that focused upon the young all the light and darkness of their tribe's collective psyche, all its sense of mystery, all its questions, and all the stories told to both harbor and answer those questions. The crucial word here is focus. The adult had something to teach. Stories, skills, magic, dances, visions, rituals. In fact, if these things were not learned well and completely, the tribe could not survive. Tribal culture satisfied the craving while supplying the need, and we call that initiation. This practice was so effective that usually by the age of 15, a tribal youth was able to take his or her place as a fully responsible adult. Ventura notices that for about 40 years, the young in our culture have generated forms, music, fashions, behaviors, quote, that prolong the initiatory moment as though hoping to be somehow initiated by chance somewhere along the way, unquote. It doesn't happen. 
Mick Jagger gets middle-aged, and still the adults offer no response to the opening. There are many sorts of initiation, many models and many sequences of rituals and teachings. We have to recognize that all sequences of initiatory stages are linear, that we know of, and initiation itself resembles a sphere. So, with that warning, we could look now at a linear view of male initiation, which I'll lay out in five stages. The first stage would be bonding with the mother and separation from the mother. We do the first stage moderately well, and the second not well at all, particularly in the suburbs and the ghettos. Second stage, bonding with the father and separation from the father. We often postpone the father bonding until we're 50 or so, and then separation still has to be done. Third, the arrival of the male mother or the mentor. The man who helps the man rebuild the bridge to his own greatness or essence. King Arthur is an example of such a male mother. With us, this step happens haphazardly, if at all. And fourth, apprenticeship to some hurricane energy, such as the wild man or the warrior or Dionysius. When the young man has done that apprenticeship well, he receives a drink from the waters of the god. Such a drink is one thing the adolescents are asking for. And the fifth stage of initiation that we'll mention then is marriage with the holy woman or with the queen. The events of our story fit roughly into this model of classic initiation. Iron John uh, represents the adult mentor who reconnects the boy to his greatness in the spring section and to his gold head. Iron John, as the wild man, is also himself the divine energy from whose waters the boy is allowed to drink. The lack of initiation in contemporary culture means that the boy receives no help in his very first task of initiation, namely separation from the mother. Our culture has paid attention in recent years, and rightly so, to men's physical incest with their daughters, which is hideous and revolting in its range and damage. And we have paid some attention to psychic incest as well between father and daughter. But the culture still does not take very seriously the damage caused by psychic incest between mother and son. Twenty to thirty percent of boys now live in houses with no adult man present. But psychic incest is by no means restricted to single-parent homes. The emphasis placed in recent decades on the inadequacy of men and on the evil of the patriarchal system encourages mothers to discount grown men. Contemporary women have also become aware of their own rich interior lives. A 20th century woman feels complicated sensibilities in herself that no ordinary or mortal man can meet. I am suggesting, then, that two contemporary trends have come together. One is the increasing emphasis in the American culture on the adult man's inadequacy, even his absurdity, and the second is the woman's increased awareness of her own interior emotional richness. When these two trends come together, Hope for change and fulfillment falls on young sons. The mother looks to the son for emotional satisfaction, and her fantasies in that regard may have deepened in recent years. It's not uncommon for grown men to turn to young women for sexual companionship. A grown woman may turn to her eight-year-old son for soul companionship. Her fantasies could include dreams that he'll redeem the crudities of other men, that he'll develop a mind open to women's values, and that she will have a soul companion in him. Perhaps, in her fantasies, he will live out some heroic scenario that she could not. Above all, she hopes that he may learn to be kind to women, kinder than his father was, and will be able to satisfy his own woman sexually. In short, she will hope that he'll become a better lover to his woman than his father was or is. Who could his woman be? Not all men move through the stages of initiation with the speed that Iron John's student does, who achieved a clean break with both mother and father early on. He has separated from the mother, separated from the father, uh, received a mentor or a male mother, and he has experienced apprenticeship to a hurricane energy, which is here called the wild man. In what way has he received a drink from the waters of the god? Most of us receive enough shame by the time we are 20 so that our body horse is three-legged. It has one shamed leg. Iron John lets him feel what it would be like to have a body without shame, a four-legged horse. The young man we are watching, who is much luckier than most of us, has passed through the ashes and the garden and the battle, 
He rode to the battlefield on a whole horse lent to him by the wild man. He has returned his whole horse to the forest and ridden home on his hobbledy hoy to the jeers of the stable boys, but he knows what he has accomplished. Why not end the story here? Men receive the warrior gift, that high ecstasy of service, from impersonal warrior mansions high in the genetic heavens. But there are things that life requires of us besides warriorhood. The warrior mode, moreover, has a poisoned or negative side. The warrior's twisted or poisoned side amounts to brutality, pillage, insistence on unconditional surrender, mindless killing, wife-beating, rape, betrayal of all the king's human values. Men invigorated by warrior energy need the ability to modulate out of the warrior mode. We know that we can't end the story here because the release from aggression or the passage through it has not yet appeared. Returning to the story, we remember that the last section ended with a victory over the king's enemies. We guess that the king's daughter has become curious about the identity of that mysterious knight who saved the kingdom. We remember that she suspects that the gardener's boy is someone unusual. It occurs to her that the only way to find out if the gardener's boy is the mysterious knight is to invite all the knights in the neighborhood to come to the court for a festival and so to show themselves. This section of the story is called The Festival of Golden Apples. We are leaving our time now. You know, in this world, people feed from flesh or fish or fowl or vegetables. But in the place to which we are going, there's another food, which is none of those. So the king said to his daughter, All right, I'll arrange a great festival that'll last three days, and you'll be the one who throws out the golden apple. Perhaps the mysterious knight will appear. After the announcement of the festival had been made, the young man rode to the forest edge and called for Iron John. Iron John, Iron John, Iron John. What do you need, he said. I want to catch the golden apple the king's daughter is going to throw. There's no problem. You virtually have it in your hands right now, Iron John replied. I'll provide you more. Red armor for the occasion and a powerful chestnut horse. The young man galloped to the field at the proper time on his chestnut horse, rode in among the other knights, and no one recognized him. The king's daughter stepped forward. She threw the golden apple right into the group of men. He was the one who caught it. Moreover, having caught it, he galloped off and was gone. When the second day arrived, Iron John had him fitted out with white armor, and provided him with a white horse. This time also, the apple fell into his hands. Once more, he did not pause for even an instant, but galloped off. That made the king angry. And the king said, This behavior is not allowed. He is supposed to ride over to me and report his name. If he catches the apple a third time, and he gallops off again, he said to his men, Chase him. What's more, if he refuses to return, give him a blow. Use your sword. Now, for the third day of the festival, Ion John gave the young man a black horse with black armor, black bridle. That afternoon, the young man caught the apple again. But this time, when he rode away with it, the king's men galloped after him, and one got close enough to give him a leg wound with the end of his sword. The young man escaped, but his horse made such a powerful leap to do that that the young man's helmet fell off, and everyone could see that he had golden hair. And the king's men rode home and told the king everything that had happened. Three themes or details in this passage seem to demand attention. The meaning of the golden apples, the curious nature of this festival, and the sequence of three colors insisted on for the horses. The golden apples in this story, as in many other stories, hint that the events are happening in some special space or time that they are connected with ritual. The apple associates with immortality. 
And we know that some young men, when about to be sacrificed in the Greek ritual of Adonis, were given a golden apple as a passport to paradise. The word paradise means walled space in ancient Persian, and the Celts imagined paradise to be an apple orchard in the west where death is. This correlates with all sorts of details in old European life. For example, it is the apple that is bobbed for at Halloween when the dead return to this world. Ritual banquets used to begin with the egg of the east and end with the apple of the west. It is natural that our story would now pass into ritual space. We notice that the knights do not fight during this festival. The fighting took place in the last section. The festival the king calls for does not involve javelins knocking men out of saddles, armor being pierced, sword blows that invade the intestines or take off an arm at the shoulder. Some change is being asked for in the expression of warrior energy. We could say here that the young man learns to modulate out of aggression through display, form, and ritual. The young men display their beauty as they pass in process, and luck determines who gets the apple. Victor Turner, the anthropologist, has recovered in recent decades an almost forgotten concept of ritual space. Each person's interior emptiness, one could say, has its own shape. In ordinary life, we try to satisfy our longings and fill the emptiness. But in ritual space, both men and women learn to experience the emptiness or the longing and not to fill it. A man, for example, could be in the presence of innocence without moving to have sexual intercourse with it, enjoy his fierceness without acting it out physically, know his mother's neediness without moving to satisfy it, a warrior can enjoy the beauty of his sacred warriorhood without engaging in battle. In our story, during the festival, each knight joins the other knights in a parade or display where there is no violence. Having moved into ritual space, he slows down his speed, gives grace to his movements, offers a bow to the king and queen, pushes through no boundaries, offers no hostility, is there to be seen we could say that this graceful display moves the princess to throw the apple at precisely the right moment. Biologists once thought that herons and geese created their puzzling ritual dances for fertility or survival reasons, that they were, in the word we use about ourselves, practical. But biologists in recent years, after extensive observation of herons, deer, geese, peacocks, and so on, have concluded that some ritual dances have no particular value for survival. They amount to display. Ritual space carries the young man out of machismo, out of battle, out of dominator fantasies. Blake called the highest stage of consciousness constant creativity, or the shining city of art. The golden apple lets one into the paradise of form. The knights in the festival participate in display as an expression of the love of form and beauty. It is closer to art than strutting. They are being led by ritual space away from war and toward community. Vietnam veterans would be in better shape today if we had arranged a festival in every small town of the country in which the veterans had ridden by and a young woman had thrown them golden apples. That parade would have honored their return to domestic life and included them in ceremonies of the golden apples, thousands of years old. The Vietnam era commanders had no ritual to help the veterans when they arrived home. The army flew them to New York and dumped them in the street. We all know what happened. More Vietnam men have now committed suicide since the war than died during it. The Black Wall in Washington is an attempt to remedy that failure. It's also a testimony to the Army's lack of imagination and to our reckless forgetting of all that men in the past knew about this supremely important change from warrior to non-warrior. We need to look next at the red, the white, and the black horses. The story says clearly that Iron John gave the young man a different colored horse, saddle, and armor on each of the three successive days, and we sense that some sort of information is being offered in that detail. All we can do is investigate the three colors and their associations and see what happens. We recall that the queen in Snow White was sewing one day near an ebony window frame as the snow fell outside, and when she pricked her finger, three drops of blood fell on the snow. 
She said, I want a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as this window frame. The fairy tale hero or heroine, whether in Russian, German, or Finnish tales, who chances to see a drop of red blood fall from a black raven into the white snow, sinks immediately into a yogic trance. That suggests the vast power that red, black, and white have or have had over human consciousness up through the Middle Ages. European fairy tales, when we examine them, insist on these three colors, and in Europe these three colors appear in a certain order. The best known order or sequence of these colors is that mentioned in Snow White, white, red, black. We can call this order the Great Mother Sequence. White, red, black names the three phases of the moon. First, the white of the virgin and the new moon. Then the red of motherhood and the full moon. And finally, the black of the crone as the old moon. We each follow this path from innocence to fatherhood and motherhood and finally to death. Our story remembers another road. If the Great Mother sequence lays out the feminine mysteries of life and death, then we could say that Iron John's sequence lays out the masculine mysteries of wounding and growth. This road begins with red. It goes red, white, black. If the young woman begins with the white of innocence or the white dress of confirmation, then the boy begins with red. The old initiators among the Gisu and Maasai in Africa lead the young Moran men, as they call them, immediately into the red. There the young men are encouraged to flare up, fight, see red, get into trouble. And in emotions, they are encouraged to express pride, to be arrogant, antisocial, quarrelsome, and be friends with anger. And the girls encourage them to fight. When a young man is red, he shows his anger. He shouts at people. He flares up like a match with a sulfur tip. He flushes red with anger. He fights for what is his, stops being passive, walks on the balls of his feet, is a red hawk, is fierce. Of course, no one trusts a red man very far. We try in our culture to overlook and leap over this red stage completely. We try these days to move young men by compulsory education directly from childhood into the white night. And we could say that sometimes a mother wants her son to be white when he's already in red. Conversely, a man in midlife may want his wife to be white and respectable when she has already moved into red. We know that the wild man in our story gives the young man a red horse on the first day. On the second day, he gives a white horse. What shall we say about white? A white knight is gleaming and shining. We usually make fun of that. But a white knight is also engaged. He fights for the good. He's no longer randomly antisocial. Ralph Nader is a white knight. He engages the corporate world. The danger with the white knight stage in our culture is that he is often insufferable because he has not lived through the red. White knights in our culture support the Cold War and project bad redness onto the American Indians or the red communists or wild women or black men. If a man hasn't lived through the red stage, he is a stuck white knight who will characteristically set up a false war with some concretized dragon, such as poverty or drugs or Saddam Hussein. The Bush-Dukakis debate was the sad debate of two stuck white knights. Such debates are remarkably boring. Now, on the third day, Iron John gives the young man in our story a black horse with black saddle, black bridle, black armor. He is riding the black horse when he makes his decisive descent into woundedness and is wounded by the king's men. We can see increasing darkness at the edges of Rembrandt's paintings as he gets older. If you place in order Lincoln's photographs during his last four years, you can see him go into the black. People who are in the black usually give up blaming others. A mother once got into the White House and woke Lincoln up at five in the morning, saying that her son had been sent by train to Washington a few days before, had had no sleep, had been assigned to guard duty on arriving, had fallen asleep, and now was going to be shot at eight that morning. If Lincoln had been in the red, he might have shouted for the guards, Who let this woman in here? Get her out of here! 
If he were in the white, he might have said, Madam, we all have to obey rules. Your son didn't obey the rules, and I feel as bad about it as you do, but I can't intervene. He didn't say any of these things. He said, Well, I guess shooting him wouldn't help him much. And he signed a piece of paper. We notice that humor comes in with the black. If we take nothing else away from the Iron John story, we could usefully take this idea that the young male moves from red intensity to white engagement to black humanity. Each man is given three horses that he rides at different times of his life. We fall off and we get back on. I don't think we should consider one horse better than another. All we can say is that none should be skipped. We need three skills for each horse has its own sort of gait. Each horse shies at different things, responds to a rider differently. Something has been left over from the story of the festival with the golden apples, and that is the wound to his leg the young man has just received. The new wound acts to concentrate the young man's attention on his thigh. As our story has proceeded, the young man has become more and more in touch with underworld treasures, its ashes, its armed men, its horses, and now the young man is sent, so to speak, to the lower half of his own body. A wounded leg affects locomotion. It's as if the boy's first wound to his finger sped him up, and this one slows him down, way down. The old tradition says that feeling is associated with slowness. Perhaps this wound deepens his feeling. Some old traditions say that no man is adult until he's become open to the soul and the spirit world, and they say that such an opening is done by a wound in the right place at the right time in the right company. A wound allows the spirit or soul to enter. People too healthy, too determined to jog, too muscular, may use their health to prevent the soul from entering. They leave no door. Through the perfection of victory, they achieve health, but the soul enters through the whole of defeat. It is likely that in Iron John we are dealing with an initiatory wound, perhaps a wound given physically by old men initiators at some time in the past. We can speculate that the mentors gave a young man a thigh wound at some late stage of initiation. Apparently, the leg wound, when accomplished ritually or done in ritual space, strengthened young men. In mythology, we remember that Dionysius was born from Zeus's thigh. Because Dionysius' destiny was to be a man with two mothers, Zeus's thunderbolt ended his stay in Semele's womb. One story says that Hermes saved the unborn boy and sewed him up inside Zeus's thigh. Another story says that Zeus himself made the opening in his own thigh in order to provide a womb for Dionysius. This sort of thinking is thousands and thousands of years old. Andre Leroy Gorhan, who spent years studying the enigmatic Dordogne cave paintings, concluded that the famous scene of the wounded mammoth, the shaman in trance, and the bird-headed wand amounts to a study of the wound. We know from Siberian sources that the shaman must needs be a wounded man, and the spear gave Christ a wound in his side before his death. The old tradition says that women have two hearts, one heart in their chest, and another heart in their womb. They are double-hearted. The old initiators then ritually make the young man, through the wound given in ritual space, double-hearted by giving him a womb in the thigh. Now the man has the physical heart he has always had, but he also has a compassionate heart. After having received the wound then, the young man is ready to become a king, that is, to sit down with a queen. And we'll see how the story says that. It's time for the story once more. We're leaving our time now. And we're going to a place where grapes do not only produce wine, but they produce a drink that we don't know, that only those in that world know. The king's daughter the next day inquired uh, to the gardener about his boy. 
Oh, he's back at work in the garden. That strange coot, you know, went to the festival yesterday, and he only got back last night. He showed my children, by the way, three golden apples that he had won. Well, the king called the young man in, and he appeared with his tarbouche back on his head. The king's daughter, however, went up to him and pulled it off, and his golden hair fell down over his shoulders. His beauty was so great that everyone was astounded. The king said, Are you the knight who appeared each day at the festival with a different colored horse and each day caught the golden apple? I am, he said, and the apples are here. Taking the apples from his pocket, he handed them to the king. If you need more evidence, you can look at the wound that your men gave me when they were chasing me. What's more, I am the knight who helped defeat the enemy. The king said, if you can perform feats of that magnitude, you are obviously not a gardener's boy. Who is your father, may I ask? My father's a notable king, and I have a great deal of gold, as much as I will ever need. It's clear, the king said, that I am in debt to you. Whatever I have in my power that would please you, I will give. Well, the young man said, I suggest that you give me your daughter as my wife. Then the king's daughter laughed, and she said, I like the way he doesn't beat about the bush. I already knew he was no gardener's boy from his golden hair. And she walked over and she kissed him. The young man's walk on an exclusively masculine path has now ended. The wild man, who is a god of nature, has guided the young man's initiation. Iron John's teaching never aimed at masculine separation or separatism anyway. And we will soon see how deeply and in how many different ways the progress of our story involves partnership with the feminine principle. In nature, the yang and the yin interweave everywhere. Nature is inconceivable without the incessant and joyful intermingling of receptivity and initiative curiously mingled in all snail shells and oak trees, all tigers, all mountains, all bees. Time moves more swiftly in a fairy tale than with us, or more slowly. And the man in earth time would be about 50 years old now, or older. Some flower has finally unfolded and blossomed. The young man has received through his descent a grounding that allows him to reconnect with some creativity that would have frightened him when he was younger. Most psychological systems don't want any expression of masculine grandeur. All talk of grandeur is called inflation. Our story carries from its outset a different view. It holds that human self-esteem is a delicate matter and not to be dismissed as infantile grandiosity. Our, in quotation marks, mirrored greatness, end of quotation marks, as Heinz Kohut calls it, needs to be carefully honored, neither inflated nor crushed. If a man or a woman's mirrored greatness is entirely dismissed, he or she will become crippled and a candidate for all sorts of invasions by the group mind. The Indian poet Kabir says, referring to the body, Inside this clay jug there are canyons and pine mountains and the maker of canyons and pine mountains. All seven oceans are inside and hundreds of millions of stars. The young man in our story has become a friend of the wild man and has received a drink of that luminous water. He has not lost his connection to the king, and the warrior has offered him a cup as well. All of this rebuilding of the bridge, all of this honoring of the great self, all of this distribution of those true waters that satisfy thirst has been in our story under the guidance of the wild man. So perhaps it's time now to ask, who is this wild man. Western man's connection with the wild man has been disturbed or interrupted for centuries now, and a lot of fear has built up. Every angel is dangerous, Rilke says. So, some fear is appropriate, but knowing nothing is not appropriate. Rather than looking outside for a wild man, we could look at the traces that remain inside us. One trace of the wild man is the spontaneity we have preserved from childhood. When the wild man has been preserved inside, a man also feels a genuine friendliness toward the wildness in nature. Thoreau said, in literature, it is only the wild that attracts us. I think we are remembering the wild man now, and women are remembering the wild woman and other invigorators, because men and women need now, more than ever in history, to protect the earth, its creatures, the waters, the air, the mountains, the trees, the wilderness,
Moreover, when we develop the inner wild man, he keeps track of the wild animals inside us and warns us when they are liable to become extinct. The wild man, we could also say, represents the positive side of male sexuality. The hair that covers his whole body is natural, like a deer's or a mammoth's. He has not been clean-shaven out of shame, and his instincts have not been so suppressed as to produce the rage that humiliates women. The wild man's sexuality does not feed on the feminine, or on pictures of the feminine. It resonates also to hills, clouds, and ocean. The Native American has much wild man in him, and it comes out in love of ordinary things. The wild man also encourages a trust in what is below. The wild man encourages a trust of the lower half of our body, our genitals, our legs and ankles, our inadequacies, the souls, as we call them, of our feet, the animal ancestors, the earth itself, the treasures in the earth, the dead long buried there, the stubborn richness to which we descend. And finally, the wild man's energy is that energy which is conscious of a wound. His face, which we can see in medieval carvings, and his body, which we can see in a small basalt statue from about 4,000 B.C., contains grief, knows grief, shares grief with nature. The hard survivor in us has survived to adulthood, and each of us is a survivor. But the wild man leads the return we eventually have to make as adults to the place of childhood abuse and abandonment. The wild man is a better guide in some ways to that pain than our inner child is, precisely because he is not a child. Because he is not a child, he knows stories and can lead us into the personal suffering and through it. We must note that the aim is not to be the wild man, but to be in touch with the wild man. No sane man in Greece would say, as I've mentioned, I want to be Zeus. But in American culture, past and present, we find people who want to be the wild man. Writers as intelligent as Kerouac failed to make a distinction between being the wild man and being in touch with. Trying to be the wild man ends an early death in confusion for everyone. We are ready now to turn to the last scene of the story, in which the masculine and the feminine, the heaven and the earth, the king and the queen come together at last. We notice that the original mother and father are also present. We are looking at a wedding ceremony interrupted by a strange event. This is the last scene in the story. We are leaving our time now. We want to repeat that we honor east, west, north, south. And we also honor the fifth direction, the vertical one that is in us here today. So the wedding feast was about to take place. And the young man's mother and father were among those invited to the wedding, and they came. They were in great joy because they had given up hope that they'd ever see their dear son again. While all the guests were sitting at the table for the marriage feast, the music broke off all at once. The great doors swung open, and a baronial king entered, accompanied in procession by many attendants. He walked up to the young groom, and he embraced him, and the guest said, I am Iron John, who through enchantment turned into a wild man. You have freed me from that enchantment, and all the treasure that I own will from now on belong to you. As we look back at the story, we realize that the wild man has been slowly ascending step by step in harmony with the young man's slow descent. We have become used to seeing the wild man as wet, moist, foresty, ignorant, leafy, and all at once he is related to holy intellect and sun radiance. He is a king. 
The energy that is hidden by water, dark, lying on its back among reeds in the opening scene, becomes a luminous power here. As we watch, the great doors of the wedding hall open, and a baronial king enters with many well-dressed attendants. And when we hear or read this last scene, we say in some shock, Whose story was this? We assumed it was the boy's story, but we see that it may be the wild man's story. And there is something we were ignorant of, some invisible force that we knew nothing about, has put the sophisticated energy of this being into a primitive form and shape, as if into a cage. Our work, then, as men and women, is not only to free ourselves from family cages and collective mindsets, but to release transcendent beings from imprisonment in trance. And that's a surprise. That's what the story says in the end. Our obligation, and I include in our, all the women and men writing about gender, is to describe masculine in such a way that it does not exclude the masculine in women, and yet hits a resonant string in the man's heart. No one says there aren't resonating strings in a woman's heart too, but in the man's heart there's a low string that makes his whole chest tremble when the qualities of the masculine are spoken of in the right way. Our obligation is to describe the feminine in a way that does not exclude the feminine in men, but makes a large string resonate in the woman's heart. Some string in the man's heart will resonate as well, but I suspect that in the woman's heart there is a low string that makes her whole chest tremble when the qualities of the feminine are spoken of in the right way. At the same time, we all know that there are in reality, besides these two states, feminine and masculine, all sorts of degrees, intermediate states, unions, combinations, special cases, genius exceptions, and so on. For the time being, it is the men and women who are passed through the grief door into their own childhood to whom the story we've retold will speak best. They will be able to use the story, and others like it, blessedly preserved by the memory culture that our ancestors lived in up until the time of writing. The young man in our story descended from courtyard to ashes, from ashes to earth, then to horses under the earth, and so on. The wild man passes him on the way up, having ascended from under the water to the courtyard, then to his own sacred spring, then to the master of horses, and finally to the state of kingship. The wild man part of each man that was once in touch with wilderness and wild animals has sunk today down below the water of the mind, out of sight, below human memory. Covered with hair now, it looks as if it were an animal itself. The wild man in our wedding scene says, in effect, a strong power forced me by enchantment to live under the water until a young man appeared who was ready to undergo the discipline and go through the suffering that you have gone through. And now that you have done that, I can appear as I am, a lord.